So excited. Um, so my name is Kevin Pratt. I'm from the Western Eastern Student Studies Department. And I am so happy to be welcoming back uh, Eugene Sashevsky uh, again to Kelly Writer's House. Um, I'll be quick. Um, but if you really just want to get to the gist of kind of like how I'm going to approach the discussion. But Eugene's thesis at NYU dealt in New York got his PhD at Stanford, which is where I met him when I was doing my PhD there. Um, he is both a scholar and a poet and a translator, and his projects really um, you know, range across languages and topics. Uh, one of the, I think, most important scholarly projects that he's been involved with is the translation of uh, the poets of the Abiriyu, which was a very late avant-garde movement that didn't really actually get published much during uh, its existence because it was coming in uh, at, at the end of the, the era of possibility for avant-garde poetry in Stalinist Russia. Um, and he, as well as Matvey Yankadevich and some others have been responsible for a, um, the recovery of this poetry in English um, with translations such as this one that Eugene did a couple of years ago uh, with the New York Review of Books uh, press, Alexander Vidyansky, An Invitation for Me to Think, um, and other um, installments of that project. Uh, he has millions of honors, um, you know, day a day, artisan residence, fellowships, best translated book award from 3%, a national translation award from the American Literary Translation Association. Um, he's been a guest professor at the Humboldt in, in Berlin. Um, and he's the author of, of four books of poetry, uh, as well as numerous chapbooks. Uh, the most recent book uh, is what he's going to read from in part today, The Pirate Who Does Not Know the Value of Pi. Um, uh, and he'll also read from some of his newer work, uh, The Feeling Sonnets, which are going to be coming out as a chapbook soon. Um, so I'll let him take over, and then after he reads for a little while, we're going to sit down and have a little bit of a discussion and bring you all into the discussion as well at some point. And the plan is to have this whole thing wrapping up around uh, one. But there's no actual event in this space afterwards, so we can you know, continue discussing afterwards. But I, I understand people will start trickling out. So one is more or less the, the, uh, the coda. So Eugene, thank you so Thanks. much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you, Jessica, for the invitation. So yeah, I'm going to start by reading from this book, uh, where there's uh, it's a book of poems, but in a way it's a novel. There are two characters, a pirate and a parrot. This is the story of the pirate and his parrot not unlike the ballad of Bonnie and Clyde, who, however, were a little more desperate and disparate. On the day of their meeting, the pirate was not yet a pirate, although always aspiring to become one when an adult, he had amassed a vast private collection of pirate arms, yataguns, grappling hooks, blunderbusses, Malaysian Chris's, 358 total. The parrot was already a parrot. How they met closed circuit cameras agree. In a dark pet store on a dank day, both nose and beak were full of mucus. Not a little nervously, the two confided in each other how much they loved to play with boorishly booming bazookas. They assaulted tourists from Bali all the way to the Venice Biennale, then took a trip down to California where they worked as instructors of calisthenics, calibration, and calligraphy. Cooked <laughs> cauliflowers, then consolidated themselves in crime and finally, with the proceeds, bought themselves a galleon 
in case they should come across a large store of gold bullion. It was then they took to the sea and took up piracy. They raided packet boats, pedal boats, and boats at once packet and pedal, polanders, perroques, pontoons, and gondolas made of metal, dows, dinghies by darkest, catamarans and clippers, felucas, garucas, tankers, bathtubs, and bathroom slippers. <coughs> but whether on a wavy wave or on a coconut strewn shore, they never did forget that old dark and dank pet store, not even when filling their coffers or beheading recently met coffers. They worked hard, became successful and wealthy. They bought art and a split-level house in New Jersey, although they were never in it for the cash, but because the criminal form of life is such a blast. What a beautiful song, said the pirate. I wish I knew all the ship names in it. Shh, said the pirate. We'll look them up later. Later when, asked the pirate. When this book is over, said the, pirate. the pirate fell into deep thought. Will we exist when this book is over? He suddenly asked. If it's a good book, said the pirate. <laughs> ah, cool. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, it's hot. I'm gonna read in my T-shirt to go to bed. Um. Uh, okay, so this poem at the end of it has a character who is a Russian uh, early 19th century romantic poet who became a Decemberist and was imprisoned. Um, the pirate sails the Spanish main. His ship describes a mark of chain. He stands at the bow and imbibes champagne. He takes in the tingling air. The parrot squints from a migraine and would rather be elsewhere. I often think about the relationship of experience to language, says the pirate who does not know the value of pi. All these things happen to us and we can't always match them with words. How, do, how does that make them different? Am I asking for something that like skirene fas leokanoe or can one maintain a position on the divergence between the verbal and the nonverbal? With us, for instance, since you're so much more verbal than I, is your experience of the sea essentially other than my experience? And I mean essentially? Furthermore, can I in any way understand an experience that is other than mine, an experience that is authentically your experience, or rather my experience with a pronoun referring to somebody other than me? In the same way, if I had a girlfriend, how might I give her subjectivity its full due, thereby treating another human being as Kant says she deserves to be treated already by the virtue of her humanity and additionally by the virtue of her girlfriendness towards me? <laughs> Would I need to draw attention away from the signs and symptoms of our difference, such as, for instance, the more foregrounded of our sexual characteristics? Or would it, on the contrary, be best to say straight out, here are your sexual characteristics, and here are mine. They seem to be quite different. I don't really know what to do about that. I admit that it frightens me. I admit that a lot of things frighten me. The other day, for example, when we attacked that merchantman bound for wherever it was bound, like for Alba Longa from Cartagena, no? And boarded it for its cargo of regret. As I advanced against the enemy captain with my lucky falchion, the one whose scabbard has my mother's beadwork of quotations from Sidney Dobble, he of the spasmodic school, in my right hand, and my double sudden blunderbuss number 00 in my left, there was cannon smoke everywhere and splashes of blood and the hoarse shouts of the mortally wounded or the simply overexcited. He fought real well, I must say, with his two scimitars and a hand cannon, at least until I chopped off his right arm. Wait, was it his left? No, it was on my left, so it must have been his right. I suddenly became frightened. I don't really know of what, that I wouldn't be able to represent any of this in language, and the experience would vanish from the sensory world, 
but at the same time take root inside me, unformulated, ineffable, and therefore not even truly a thing, certainly not truly mine, yet also no one else's but mine, mine exclusively, inalienably, and so locking me at once inside and outside itself, although always in solitary confinement, as it were, like Yuchil Becker and the Peter and Paul fortress, but without the tapping code, and also the fortress ineffable, and the guards and Kuchelbecker himself, and also with Kuchelbecker being not just in the role of Kuchelbecker, but also the guard of Kuchelbecker, all the while remaining ineffable and impalpable and incorporeal, but at the same time barely kind of uncomfortably restless, just a bit, almost imperceptibly, but still uncomfortable. I can't do this poem in the pirate voice because the lines are too loud. <laughs> I mean, I normally do pirate things in pirate voices, but... Um. <clears throat> okay, this is called He Does the Abardash in Different Voices. Abardash is a Russian word, except it's from the French, which is from the English. And it, it comes from the word to board. Yeah, to board a ship. This is what pirates do. Um, at work. This is what pirates do at work. This is not what they do when they're relaxing at home. <laughs> oh, shall we go now, Bardash, Captain, my captain. What? Excuse me, where'd you get that word? Captain, I got it from the Russian. It doesn't sound very Russian. Captain, this is no time for etymology. A Turkish dreadnought has opened her gun ports, and me four be I see in row upon row the mouths of homologous ordnance. Dreadnoughts don't have gun ports, boatsman. <laughs> Who are you going to believe? My eyes are your picture dictionary. Music. Papugai, 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 davai, papugai, как следует, извергав, не извергай, виск, извергай, писк, запускай, папугай, повторяй, припев, попирать помаленьку, напирать на попугая, пропирать попугая, подпирать опять, отпирать свое. Who's that singing so unnotingly in the crow's nest? Ebony mother, ahoy there in the crow's nest. What? I can't hear you. I'm in the crow's nest. You want cat of square root of 80 tails? Can't hear you. Cat, 8.9442719. I'll never get to tails that way. Afraid not. So it has afraid not. Where can I get a new cat in the middle of the sea? Captain, the Turkish dreadnought is bearing down upon us. Butsman, how can she be bearing down upon us if you just saw her portholes? I'm not responsible for my language, sir. Ebony mother, who gave me this Jack Spicer for a botsman? <laughs> Twas the market, sir. Freedom of trade, you said freedom of trade. Pirates don't believe in union wages. So you hired me. I am not in the botsman's union. By training, I'm a parrot. I'm sock, he's so selfish as to bring up wages at this time. Captain, the Turkish dreadnought is frantically signaling. Find out what they want. Captain, I don't speak Turkish except for invective. Ahoy there, Turban the Ataturk. Michael Jackson is. We don't speak Turkish. But what about your flag? It used to be Soviet, but we can't find the hammer and the sickle handle fell off. <laughs> oh, half power sickle. Oh, cowardly dreadnought. Oh, battleship Potomkin village. Row, row, column, column, сегодня топан, завтра не поймал. Exactly, where the common goyim. <laughs> what meaning do they speak of, boatsman? None. They let their words get the best of him, sir. In that case, the inopposite punning of these pundits shall get no plaudits from this pirate, boatsman, for I'm pooped of these language games. I want meaning. You read my thoughts like a book, sir. Dedificatione colorum, great pun is dead by Plut, if you allow it, sir. And so, my pretty parrot, get the pirate ship ready for conflict. Ahoy, all hands on deck. Up, dogs, that's not what it means. Ebony mother, nabardash, don't fire until you see the signs of their whiteout. <laughs> um, and then, when they, when pirates came, oh, um, so when I was working on this, I started um, looking up what, people say about pirates and parrots, you get this incredible uh, kind of encyclopedia of them on cultural symbols. And it was curious in the way that one of the things that 
piracy is connected with in, in the contemporary imagination is uh, business, especially high-level business, uh, and serious money-making. In part, this makes sense because uh, somehow piracy is often funded by something like a very primitive stock market, whether in Elizabethan England or even in Somalia 10 years ago, like a whole village would buy shares in a pirate ship, a boat, whatever. And, the, and according to how much they bought, they would get. Um, so it's, it's an early form of venture capitalism. And it's funny that once I came across a photo of like the first Christmas party of Microsoft, and they had a huge Jolly Rogers over in, in their, um, you know, the living room, wherever. Okay, so this is what pirates do when they um, take over ships. It's called pirate party music. Pyth pirate. How many pirates does it take to calculate the value of pi? Fyth pirate. I don't know, how about a party? <coughs> Eth pirate. Yo, Gunna, what you got that smoking? Pi to the Eth pirate. Eyes on the prize. Party with a pie, parrot pluckers. Canna drums. Who's that Chewbacca doing handstands on the cap stand? Who's hopping on the peg leg saying, you know I don't abstain? Who's drumming up the rum butt? Why, it's the uncaptain. The poop deck's like the letter. It's got a stamp on. It's a pirate party. It's a pirate party. So shake your booty. Never mind the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Shimmy with your scimitar and uncoral some quarrels. You're all so handsome, you'll get a big ransom. It's, if it's all hands on deck, they'll raise an insane storm. Scratch a blunder off your blunder bus. It's no blunder to plunder. The wheels on this bus are going rounder and rounder. Wave your bus in the air. It will get you anywhere. The passengers are panicking to pay their fare. Like Ralph Cramden and Ed Norton. You might come from Camden, but you'll get into the Norton. It's a pirate party, it's a pirate party, so shake your booty. It's a pirate party, it's a pirate party, leave duty in Djibouti. Somali pirates of the Caribbean got nothing on me. Even when I'm peeing, I'm being ornery. I calculate the value of piastres like Mitt Romney. I climb the frigate rigging, bringing the triggers on me. Bullets are like boarding in that they don't bore me. I dispel boredom at board meetings saying, hello, board members, care to walk the plank? I want to say thank you to you for your support of my disporting ashore and your offshore hoarding. For bank rolling the rolling, I do have the porting. For adding the ding I have to the fun, I have cavorting. Your boarding school had your reporting on importing and exporting, but my boarding school was no frills. It's one, it's one major was boarding, and I got magna cum laude in a crowd of rowdies. I'm the rowdiest. I appear and disappear so fast. They call me the quantum pirate. Yo, it's the Max Planck. I walk because you know I'm so maximum. I eat of crystal plates placed next to a chrysanthemum. I'm full of stratagem. Parrots think I'm a total gem and cockatoo skipping double dutch without slipping. Cool, I'm most likely to disrupt international shipping. It's a pirate party. It's a pirate party. So shake your booty. It's a pirate party, it's a pirate party, leave duty in Djibouti. It's a pirate party, it's a private party, put on tutus, you're looting good. Um, ooh. Right, one second. Okay, so in this poem, all the nouns are capitalized. A certain, I should have said in this poem, all the nouns are capitalized. A certain pirate had concern for his health, and so he emigrated to Germany. It was there he learned the best technique of effective hand washing. Germans wash their hands in the following manner, which is the best. First, they take one hand, which can be the left or the right. Here, the handler performs a discriminations avoidings effort. Then they take another hand. Then, using the second hand, they wash the first hand. And only then do they use the first hand to wash the second hand. It is never the other way around. That's the technique. That's how they do it in Germany. As the result of this technique, there are very few germs left in Germany. <laughs> um, 
one of the things I was reading when I was working on this was the first textbook, I, I don't know if you can call it a textbook, of ornithology. Um, and it was uh, published, it was written uh, by a guy named Luis Aldrovandi, who was a professor at Bologna. It came out in 1599, uh, the same year as Henry V, and Shakespeare's working on Hamlet, blah, blah, blah. And it's super interesting uh, because, um, well, first of all, there's a chapter on parrots, but then there's also a chapter on sphinxes and griffins. And then when he deals with parrots, when he deals with like dead parrots, like things you can dissect, it's, it's very modern. I mean, he talks about anat, I mean, modern, more or less. Um, you have illustrations of parrot anatomy, which are, you know, somewhat scientific. Um, but then when it's time for him to talk about parrot behavior, it doesn't occur to him to get a parrot or to, you know, at least go over somebody's house that has a parrot. It's like Aristotle says, uh, you know, Pliny the Elder says, uh, I have a friend of a friend who says, and this is what a friend of a friend says, except I changed it a little bit. The parrot of Henry VIII fell out of the palace window and into the Thames. He did not know how to swim. He took to splashing about and shouting, a boat, a boat for 12 pounds. A boatman who was boating said, here's a bird with a golden throat. I like the singing of her. For the parrot, being an oriental, had a circlet of ruby color about the throat. Then the boatman said, where's my 12 pounds? But the parrot said, the king will hand it you. The boatman entered the palace. The king was enjoying a guinea fowl, and in heavy remembrance of all these things his second wife used to do with her mouth. The boatman said, behold your bird for 12 pounds. The king turned to the bird parrot and said, what says you? The parrot said, less is more. The king ordered the boatman truncated by 12 pounds, for he was more king than kind. Um. Okay, and at a certain point, they uh, are shipwrecked. This is how they're shipwrecked. This is the tale of castaways who don't know the value of pi. They memorized it to several decimal places, yet how it goes on, they can't say. Is this a seven or a five, an eight or 22? What happens in position n? What happens after it like when? and yields to n plus one, and then n plus one to n plus two. The rain did rain and sideways blow. The pirate ship was tossed on billows towards stars that wouldn't glow in some kind of vertical do -si do Above them H2O and lo, there was H2O below. And the parrot parlayed to the pirate, oh no, we're entirely lost. Put the futtock shrouds into the lubber's hole. Drop the main topmast jack stays. Yearly, yearly, full toot. It was the pirate that exclaimed a lot. Slack the ball ends. What's the use, said the parrot. We're lost. Set the gallants onto the paxel. I mean the foxel. That was, again, the pirate. Tush fui, said the parrot. You can't just abandon all hope, parrot, explained the pirate. Haven't you heard of that experiment when they put two frogs into two glasses of milk and one gave up and drowned, but the other kept swimming until the milk turned into yogurt? Also, Descartes says that if you're lost, you just need to pick a direction and stick to it. You'll end up somewhere. But what if you can't end up there in a finite number of steps? Because I don't do transcendental magnitudes, complained the parrot. I'm only a bird. <laughs> Nonetheless, said the pirate who doesn't know the value of pi, go to it, watch the flying jibs. Their ship ran aground on the shore of a deserted desert isle with a pirate who doesn't know the value of pi and his parrot to cracking a relieved smile. There once was a pirate and a parrot, or rather there once were a pirate and a parrot who after a shipwreck ended up on a deserted island. This island is deserted, said the pirate. No, it's not, said the parrot. 
Do you know something I don't, said the pirate. It can't be deserted for on it, said the parrot. No, ain't, utterly, forget about it, rejection, ah, ga ga ga, ah, ridiculous, poof poofed the pirate. Um, and the first letters of what the pirate says, they say naufragar, uh, to be shipwrecked, but it's, um, in Italian, it's a word that's associated with the sonnet of Leopardi and about being shipwrecked in the infinite. Um, yeah, they spend the rest of the book on the island. I'm getting so used to this island, it's becoming like second nurture to me. What if we never get rescued? Maybe you should think of our catastrophe as an opportunity to become a better person. <laughs> I don't want to be a better person, I want to be a better parrot. How could you be a better parrot? There's always room for improvement. I could learn new words. You already have such a vast vocabulary, especially for a non-native speaker. <laughs> Why am I a non-native speaker? I've been speaking your language so long, I might as well be native. It's my native language. Your native language is parrot. I forgot parrot. Your native language is what you learn in your infancy, which in your case is parrot. I've been speaking your language so long, I forgot parrot. There's no such category as naturalized speaker. I speak as well as you and use many words you don't. The words I know come more naturally and I feel their meanings more. <laughs> How would you go about evidencing that statement? It's not me speaking, it's cognitive science. <laughs> Iterate your cognitive science, you cog. Cognitive science has proven that non-native language processing affects different brain areas, employs different mechanisms, and operates less efficiently and more slowly than native processing. Really, based on what? Neuroimaging techniques that measure changes in neuronal activity as indicated by changes in blood flow to particular brain areas. <laughs> My psittisha mama, I need her more than ever now. Yes. There will always be a distance between you and your words. Oh, will they always reside as aliens in a strange land? Your voice is a giveaway. They don't sound like they're in their natural place in your throat. Oh, my very body is of two minds about them. Stop saying, oh, it's like you don't mean it, but I'm taking the part of Othello. <laughs> Pirate, are you saying you read Othello? It was a requirement in boarding school. Do you think this island has any indigenous people on it? If it does, we won't understand them or they us. Indigenous people never have any common sense. Why never? Have you met all of them? I don't have to meet all of them. That's what logic is for. If they had common sense, they would emigrate. If they emigrated, they would no longer be indigenous people, QED. But Parrot, why should they emigrate? But Pirate, why shouldn't they emigrate? Should they sit here all of their lives? Don't they deserve a second chance? Why do you take it upon yourself to speak for indigenous people? If I don't speak for them, who will? Somebody has to speak for them if they don't have any common sense. Most of what they know is numb terror under some hedge of choked cherry of viburnum, which they cannot express. <gasps> poor indigenous people. Poor, poor indigenous people. Oh, poor, unfortunate, indigent, endogamous, ingenuous. Poor genuine people, my Pope's nose. What if they show up and ask to see our visas? But we don't have any. We don't even possess passports. That's what troubles me, pirate. Suppose we get deported. We must persuade the indignant people that in our culture it's not proper to ask pirates and parrots for passports. How can you persuade anyone of anything if they don't have any common sense? But are you sure they don't have any common sense? I mean, you proved it, but are you sure? Let me read you something. Unlike their peers, the Tonga Islanders do possess native numerals up to 100,000. Not content even with this, the French poet Le Comte de Lille pressed them further and obtained numerals up to 10 to the 12th, 
However, his data was proven about publication to be partly nonsense words and partly indelicate expressions, so that the supposed series of high numerals forms at once a modest lexicon of Tongan indecency and a warning as to the probable results of taking down unverified answers from savages. <laughs> I can see why you're nervous. Ingenuous people are really hard to talk to. Ingenious people are really hard to talk to. This is called the island of the Sapir Wharf hypothesis. Um, Hello, nice weather we're having, says the parrot. How do the grammatical structures of your language affect your experience of it? Are you practicing, says the pirate from the bushes. Are you spying on me, says the parrot outside the bushes. That won't work, you know, says the pirate, climbing out of the bushes. Why? Their language might lack the expression for the grammatical structures of your language, explains the pirate. In which case, they would have no idea of what you're talking about. What, do you think I was born yesterday? They wouldn't understand a word if I used words. I'm going to translate everything into signs and gestures. But parrot, how would you render the phrase, the grammatical structures of your language, in signs and gestures? Parrot. <laughs> no, that's not entirely clear. Have you thought of this? <laughs> structures, structures, not strictures. I am trying to do structures. Less force, less force. Look at me. Try this. That might do. Shall we act it out? I'll be the native. You'll be the alien. We go to the opposite ends of the island. We turn around. We walk towards each other. and We communicate. They go to the opposite ends of the island, turn around and walk towards each other. Hello, nice weather we're having, signs the parrot. How do the grammatical structures of your language affect your experience of it? Because my verbs have no tenses, signs the parrot. It's all weather all the time for me, baby. <laughs> How interesting, signs the parrot. I see that not all your sentences are copulative. Don't use that gesture, says the pirate. They might get the wrong idea. <laughs> um, okay. um, I think I'll do one more. And then we can do the feeling silence. <laughs> okay, so... Um, this is a... Uh, a poem where um, I was going to say I didn't write a word, but I think I might have corrected one word. But in, I'm not. Sh no, in fact, I didn't. No, no, I just uh, broke it up into lines. Um, okay. So another thing that I was reading a lot, I was uh, so when I was looking up pirates and parrots, um, I was using the early English uh, text database, just. Uh, searching for books on them. I found a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, uh, but then I just started reading Hacklet, um, The Principal Navigations, um, uh, which is this giant collection, I mean, really a library um, of many editions of English travel writing. And there's a huge amount of travel stuff um, well, you'll see about what. But anyway, this is from Hacklet. And Master Chancellor held on his course towards that unknown part of the world and sailed so far that he came at last to the place where he found no night at all, but a continual light and brightness of the sun shining clearly upon the huge and mighty sea. And having the benefit of this perpetual light for certain days, at the length it pleased God to bring them into a certain great bay, which was of 100 miles or thereabout over, where into they entered, and somewhat far within it cast anchor, and looking every way about them, it happened that they espied afar off a certain fisher boat which Master Chancellor, accompanied with a few of his men, went towards to common with the fishermen that were in it. 
and to know of them what country it was and what people and of what manner of living they were. But they, being amazed with the strange greatness of his ship, for in those parts before that time they had never seen the like, began presently to avoid and to flee, but he still following them at last overtook them and being come to them, they being in great fear as men half dead, prostrated themselves before him, offering to kiss his feet. But he, according to his great and singular courtesy, looked pleasantly upon them, comforting them by signs and gestures, refusing those duties and reverences of theirs and taking them up in all loving sort from the ground. And it is strange to consider how much favor afterwards in that place this humanity of his did purchase to himself. For they, being dismissed, spread by and by a report abroad of the arrival of a strange nation of a singular gentleness and courtesy, whereupon the common people came together, offering to these newcome guests victuals freely and not refusing to traffic with them, except they had been bound by certain religious use and custom not to buy any foreign commodities without the knowledge and consent of the king. By this time, our men had learned that this country was called Russia. It's awesome. You think it's America. It's all like that they're in Newfoundland or whatever. Anyway. Um, OK, and now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to read you my train ticket. No. Um, I'll just read a couple of more pieces. OK, I've never read this one before. It's not in the Feeling Sonnets chapbook, which is not uh, published yet. Um, but I just want to know how it sounds. It's, it's a Feeling Sonnet, even though it's not in there. And it's uh, a, a good friend of mine is a composer, and she asked me to write something. I asked her to ask me to write something, and she asked me to write something for the 80th birthday of uh, a German musicologist. So I did, and then she didn't like it, and I had to write something else. But I liked it. <laughs> so um, in the second, it's important that in the second word, in the name, there are two R's and not one. If a rato is the muse of poetry, who is the muse of music? No muse is the muse of music. Any muse is the muse of music. A muse is she musing about her meaning with music. Take meaning away from musing, and all that remains is music. It is music that makes for feeling and not the meaning. Music is moving, but meaning merely amusing. We do not mean meaning, we mean the feeling of meaning. It is the feeling of moving and being moved. Therefore, we mean to mean meaning, but we mean music. Music names names. We assume it has meaning. It does not mean to. It means because it names, but it does not mean it. I feel my name being called in its omen, amen, and moan, you yours. It may be the same omen, amen, and moan. The name is not the same. Is there a ruse in the music? How does it choose us? We're all hearing. We're hearing, hearing. We're here. Here we are. Um, it is with profound ambivalence that we inform you of our feelings. We read feelings as a victory of the particular over the universal. We cannot read feelings as there are always feelings between feelings and under feelings. If we read feelings, they would be called readings. Feelings are what we feel. Can we name feelings and do they respond to their name? The name feeling suggests there's something to feel for here. Does it give us hearing? 
Is it even here? If it is not here, is it even there? Also, if a feeling responds to a name, does it correspond to the name? Or is to respond to a name to correspond to it in part and in part to part from it? Or is correspond what it takes two to when not there to give one another hearing? To give one another hearing, we repeat once more with feeling. Here are our rings taken off. Here we lie to play. We play with feeling. Where can we read if the name of the feeling we play with corresponds to the feeling? We ask if we feel the feelings that we call ours. Feelings fork like the capillaries of a leaf in the forest. We feel this forest is special. It is formed of numbers. Between one tree and another, there's always a third. This is why it is called forest. As for number, it is so named because it is numb. Between numb and numbest, there it is. Nonetheless, it too is a limit. No one has ever held or beheld a limit and coiled the leaf to roll out the life of its color all over the fingertips. That was a pleasing sentence. The outlines of our feelings lie without the amends of our names. If the forest is dense, then the numbers are real. If the numbers are real, then the feeling is squeezed. If the feeling is squeezed, then the feeling is crushed. If the feeling is crushed, then the feeling is smothered. If the feeling is smothered, it touches no one. If it touches no one, there's no one feeling. We are trying to make sense of a feeling. Making sense of a feeling is like building a boat from water. Feeling is a field. It is uneven. None of its points is like any other. A field of what? A field of being a field. A field of what? A field of being a field. Or feeling is field work, for it involves an other. When it does not involve an other, it is called fooling. Even when it does involve another, it may still be called fooling, for it never fully involves another. To outfool fooling, we think of feeling as feeling about. Feeling about means trying to touch the object of your feeling. It is often done in the dark. We feel about when we cannot see and grasp. How do we feel about each other? We feel for each other. We feel for each other in the dark. We feel for each other in the dark, trying to make sense of the feeling. And the last one, um, um, thank you very much for being here. The last one is, uh, it's, it's Germlish, German English, but it's actually uh, based on a line in Mandelstam where he says that Chasta uh, uh, Sakaisen, sometimes, sometimes you write execution, but you read song. And I was reading it, I was, I mean, I was thinking about this line, I was like, well, they're similar in Russian, but they're much more similar in German, right? Uh, uh, because lead is song and lied is suffering. And, uh, you know, you're just reversing two letters. Das lead hat gelogen, the song lied. Sorrow was the issue. Der Ausgang war leid. Was it the sorrow of love? Was es das Leid der Liebe? The sorrow of love burdens not only the soul, but also the body. Das Leid der Liebe belastet 
nicht nur die Seele, sondern auch den Leib. The soul is silly. Die Seele ist dumm. It is silly because it does not know how to speak. Sie ist dumm, weil sie nicht sprechen kann. It is language that says things in its name. Es ist die Sprache, die Sachen in ihrem Namen sagt. Actually, it says words, not things. Eigentlich sagt sie Wörter, nicht Sachen. Deutsch ist eine deutliche Sprache. The German language is limpid. Sie ist bedeutungsvoll. German is full of meaning. The meaning of German in English is closely related. English heißt English, weil es eng mit Deutsch verwandt ist. Many words in German look like many other words in German. Viele Wörter auf Deutsch ähneln vielen anderen Wörtern auf Deutsch. This endows German with a light air of duplicity. Das verleiht dem Deutschen einen leichten Touch der Doppelzungenkeit. <laughs> Often you write das Leid, but read das Lied. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that the audience has things to ask. Um, if I'm wrong, then I can ask some questions. But there must be some questions out there. Hello? Oh! And we also have a mic, yeah, if anyone wants to, to pose any questions to Eugene. I mean, that was just so wonderful. Question? I'll start with, oh wait, is that a question right there? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Hi. Yeah, that was really wonderful. Um, I wonder if you could talk about your um, like textual process for choosing your format or working with um, the words on the page. Uh, it's 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 different for for different pieces. Almost always, not almost always, always. It starts when a line appears in my head and. Uh, and and then I just start working it until some other line appears. Um, even when I incorporate other texts or when I um, uh, when I guess do research, um, it it's always it's never entirely rational. I think if you plan, it's just not going to come out well. I mean, for me, anyway. Um, and the basic rules are contrast, uh, you know, sharp montage. Um, and then, I, I mean, I rewrite obsessively. Uh, and a sonnet takes me a month. I mean, I just work and work and work and work. Um, uh, that's the process. It's not a very glorious process. Yeah. Olga has a question. Oops, sorry. Hi. Hi, thank you for the reading. It was great. I have a question about like relation to the tradition. Do you feel that your work is some kind of continuation of Russian avant-garde, like Vedinsky, or it's still different and has much more influence than just, just the works of your translations? That's um, I mean, it's, 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 thank you for the question, but it's a very complicated question. Um, uh, we were talking a bit in Charles's class about this yesterday. I mean, I grew up reading, I grew up here, um, uh, here in New York. I mean, I came to New York when I was 11, but I grew up reading Russian poetry. I read some American stuff, some English language stuff uh, in high school, but, but, but I read a lot of Russian stuff. Um, and in, in that sense, uh, I kind of oscillate between the two traditions. Um, but they're very different traditions. And um, so a, an Italian friend of mine read my translations of Vidyansky, and he was like, oh, I know where you got it. It sounds just like you. And I was like, wait, these are my translations. What do you mean? Um, but in a certain sense, um, 
what's going on is that um, the BDU were important to me, and I think they're in general important now, because to me, as a second language speaker, what they do with the language, the way they alienate it, uh, even though their reasons are, are very different, it has to do with the crash of the, the, the crash of the avant-garde, but also with the fact that they're surrounded by Soviet speak. Um, at the same time, their alienation of language and uh, makes great intuitive sense. Um, uh, it's not a poetry of wholeness. It's a poetry of things uh, broken apart, right? And in that sense, uh, you know, they relate to people like Tsalan. And if they relate to Mandelstam, they relate to Mandelstam as somebody like Tsalan reads him. And certainly not like somebody like, like Nadezhda Mandelstam reads him, right? Which is read polemically against, you know, the Soviet fake embrace of the avant-garde. Um, um, so, yeah, in, so in that sense, um, I, I do, f the Russian tradition is enormously important to me, um, but I also, I think the most important thing for me is um, this, this difference between the traditions. Um, the fact that what makes sense in one doesn't make sense in the other. Um, I see three hands, so start the back and move. Hi. So in the same venue, your book was just translated into Russian by Zapol. How was it working with a Russian translator knowing being a native speaker, or native in quotes, I guess, um, yourself? Well, this was a very special translation situation because the translator was working in my kitchen. <laughs> so, I mean, we were working together. Uh, I mean, um, I needed, uh, I, I think Zappa did a great job. Um, uh, I think he's a, he's a great translator. Um, uh, I think it was his first time really working from English because normally he works from Latvian, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but for me, I couldn't have done it myself in a way because I'm too close to the poems. But he couldn't have done it either. Yeah, you, yeah. Because right? yeah, his English is not good enough. Well, trans I mean, translation, uh, uh, there's a lot to be said for dialogue in translation, even in translation of poetry. Uh, Julia has a question, then Ron. So this kind of segues off of the other two questions um, about native tongue and mm -hmm. mother tongue. Um, and I loved the exchange between the pirate and the parrot. And I wonder where you fit in in terms of the music of the poems. Do you find yourself thinking sometimes in Russian, sometimes in English, and how kind of the, the complicated relationship within language, especially when you bring in the German too? Um, the music of the poems is maybe the most in-between thing about the poems. Because uh, in terms of musicality, for me, the most important experience is that of going from, uh, let's say, reading Mandelstam in Russian and then trying to translate that into English. So there's this incredible kind of deflation and othering that happens. Uh, uh, so there's that, kind of, I don't know, breaking of the vessels. There's that kind of breaking of the vessels that happens. Um, so that, that for me is the, when like the music is there, but you hear it in snatches um, and, and you're not sure that you hear it. Um, yeah. Ron had a question right here. Actually, it might be the same question. <coughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, there are parts in the um, book where you switch from English to Cyrillic and back again. Sometimes those are homophonic to American ears, like Boatman mm -hmm. <coughs> or Jack Spicer, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're noted along the side. 
But it, there's also this sort of click that occurs in seeing that language made alien right in front of your eyes. And then there are other portions, and, and you read a little bit of it, um, where that, um, not exactly trans, but translucency doesn't occur, mm -hmm. and where it's, it's more opaque. And somebody whose knowledge of Russian was that 30 years ago I could read a street sign. Um, you know, that's completely other in that regard. Um, and I, I'm curious as to what you're thinking as you're going through that process of putting that on the page and your rationales. Um, I, I want to thank you for the question. I want to add to this as somebody who actually can read the Russian, that the Russian is purposefully written in such a way as to make it almost impossible to read, even if you read Russian. <laughs> uh, because like the thing that I read with uh, the, the song in the middle of the Abardash poem, uh, the point of the song is the word Popogai, which is used, uh, which means parrot, right? It comes from the German. But it's the same linguistic form. You can read that linguistic form as an imperative of the verb, of the verb for to scare for a little while. Mm -hmm. So, and I tried to make it grammatically so you can figure out what's which to choose. Um, so, uh, I mean, the point is the the materiality. One of my favorite poems ever. Um, is, uh, you know the, the Man Ray poem where everything is crossed out? Mm -hmm. So to give that, and the Cyrillic is, is great for, for that. Uh, uh, you know, when the reader can't, you know, is not really a fluent Russian speaker. Um, it just, it gives this blotch, uh, fuzz, uh, and, and I like that. Um, um, so, and the other thing about using two languages side by side, uh, and not having them say the same thing is, uh, it's interesting and in, because you're creating a work that's going to, I mean, I know that all poems, all works, all trees, all bees are different to different onlookers. But you're kind of capitalizing on that fact. Uh, and it's an interesting thing to do um, because you create kind of a new kind of polyphony, a semantic polyphony consciously, that this will work for some people, but for other people, they'll hear something else. Can, can I? I so I one of my questions, which I already asked you, but I think this like maybe phrases it in a different way, um, is really about, um, you were talking just now about alienated language and non-alienated language and, and putting that together with the experience of being a non-native speaker or writing in a language which is, um, you know, you're writing now in German, which you told me earlier, you don't actually feel that you're a confident speaker of German. Um, even though I'm not even a non-confident speaker of German, <laughs> <laughs> but even though it's—I mean—it's a family language for you now right. um, that it's you speak to your children. Yeah. And, um, but um, I wanted to come back to this—the this huge distance between the pirate and the the feeling lyrics. Um, uh -huh. And as I said, just like and anyone who's like followed Eugene's career and his early chapbooks, he was more of a lyric poet, um, and then. The middle of his career and his books have been the, you know, predominantly writing at a, a greater distance from the language, like the pirate in something where the language is crafted, um, nearly always in quotes, very often spoken by a character who is not Eugene. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and now suddenly we get these extraordinary um, poems, which are truly lyric. I mean, it's you, it's your voice, and I wanted to know. You know what happened to return you to that, um, and what it feels like. What it feels like to, to use like, you know, alienated language, language, you know, lang a language that's not your own, but in your own voice, um, as opposed to in someone other. Like when you're just quoting someone's other language, that's another language. So it's like, but now it's you speaking German. So, 
Well, okay, so in a way, what, okay, so on, on a very simple level, when I finish this book, um, which in lots of ways is anti, anti-poetic, uh, uh, I was just like, okay, now I'm going to write some poetry. This is, you know, <laughs> now, now is really the right time, and I'm going to do the most kind of cliched poetry possible, which is, you know, in the Western tradition, that's the love sonnet. So, uh, but, so that's kind of the easy answer. Um, and, but then it's, so it's very scary to speak as yourself. And it's practically impossible. Uh, because the language that we speak is, you know, it's a bunch of commodities. Somebody's selling stuff to us and we're just, you know, helping somebody else sell stuff to us. Um, so, they, I mean, the question is how to speak to yourself, or how to speak as yourself, uh, using words that are yours, not yours at all, um, in such a way that something actually comes through um, in such a way that you're not just performing according to scripts, according to genres. Um, um, and, you know, the only... I, I guess the pirate looks at language from the side, but the feeling sonnets really look at language from the side, right? I mean, they're about how the word feeling you know, means this, but it also means this, right? They're about the different, they're about how they're the same words, the same word shapes, but they have different meanings. And then you, so in a way it's really, I'm speaking, but it's very hard to speak and I'm watching myself speak. And uh, maybe psychologically it came from my failure to learn German in a way also because I didn't have, I lived in Berlin, I live in Berlin, I didn't have a job in Berlin. So I was working in Paris and basically I would like fly between home where, you know, the kids are speaking mostly in German, uh, you know, where I wouldn't understand a lot. And then I would fly in and then have to go to a faculty meeting, which is in French you know, which I understood a bit better, in fact, better. Um, but, but not when I got off the plane, right? There would be like two days when I just couldn't understand anything around me. And then I would have a few more days when like I could understand it, but then I got back on the plane. So uh, in a certain sense, that's what I'm trying to do to English in, in the feeling sonnet. Um, if there's a last question, I think we have time for it, but then we probably have to close down because I see people grabbing their coats. Um, right over here. Listening to you read your poems reminds me of uh, a couple of specific things, Shel Silverstein um, and Andrew Bird, the musician. Do you listen to Andrew Bird's music? Um, both from Chicago, both kind of quintessentially mm -hmm. American people. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they've got the, the sort of playfulness with language mm -hmm. that you've got, um, which you kind of describe as a, a sort of multilingual, kind of interlingual mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of a, a, a way to describe how someone who's kind of American and, and very attached to just English um, might feel about it? How would they describe that kind of playfulness that they bring to language that seems so similar to yours? Um, well, I mean, some of it has to do with, um, some of it does have to do with just looking at words as objects that have all these different possibilities and you can you know, arrange them this way and that way, right? So on the one hand, you're speaking, but on the other hand, you're doing these cool combinations. Um, and, but then 
you know, in American English, there's lots of other languages, right? English in general is a very mixed language, right? Thanks to the Normans, thanks to Latin, thanks to uh, the Vikings, thanks to, I mean, thanks to, you know, the empire, blah, blah, blah. There's just so much stuff in it. The American English in particular is full of, uh, full of other languages full of immigrant languages, full of, um, you know, their indigenous words. They're all just all sort uh, it's, um, you know, it's, the thing with language is that if you knock on a word long enough, you'll wind up in another language. <laughs> I mean, so. All right, I think we're gonna close down, but um, before uh, we do, I just wanna remind you that there were, at, least at the beginning of this, at least, a number of um, Eugene's books for sale. I think they still are. Um, and thank you once again for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.